If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money has free speech. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. I am your host, David Delk. Our guest today is a volunteer with Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility. He will be presenting to us today a modification of his uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation on the dangers of, of nuclear power and why we need to close existing plants and move to renewable energy sources instead. So uh, welcome to the show, David. Thank you, David Dell, yeah. for yeah. having me on Populist Dialogues today. I really appreciate the chance to give my show, Why Not Nuclear, The Case Against Nuclear Power. Okay, great, good. Well, go right ahead. Okay, good. well, nuclear power all started with the genius of Albert Einstein and his great discovery that E equals MC squared. And um, in his life, he became a great activist. One of the things he said was, uh, the release of atom power has changed everything except our way of thinking. If only I had known, I should have become a watchmaker. Mm -hmm. um, so E equals MC squared, C is the speed of light, uh, so if you square that, you have an incredible large amount of energy, and um, people at first said, well, how could that possibly be, but they didn't know about nuclear reactions. So nuclear reactions do release large amounts of energy in the form of heat and radiation. Um, there's two types of nuclear power, there's fusion, which is the joining of small nuclei, the classic example being two hydrogen atoms coming together and fusing, creating one helium atom. And then the one that we're more familiar with, which is the splitting of large nuclei, uh, uranium atoms splitting and becoming many, many daughter particles, releasing energy. Yeah. With fusion, um, the process happens on the order of 100 million degrees centigrade. So it has to be contained with lasers and magnets. No, normal materials just melt. Um, in nearly 70 years, they've managed to have a six and a half minute reaction. Um, so it will be many decades, if ever, that we see fusion power being a source of, of uh, energy. It's clean, but it won't be practical for decades. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, fission is what we're familiar with, the splitting of uranium and um, creates radiation heat uh, energy and many fission products. Um, among those dozens of react radioactive products is plutonium-239, which is, has been called the most toxic substance known to humans. Um, cesium-137, strontium-90, and many more. Um, these fission products have various serious health effects, and really this is the fatal flaw of nuclear power. Um, radiation in large doses will make you sick or kill you outright, but at small doses it can cause cancers like leukemia, bone cancer, thyroid cancer, liver cancer, brain cancer, and many others. In addition to the cancers, there are other health effects of radiation. Uh, that would include reduced immune function and heart problems, a condition called failure to thrive in children, spontaneous abortion and miscarriage, and birth defects, some of which are inheritable. How does the damage occur? Well, the radiation enters the cell and breaks the DNA molecule. Now, our cells can repair some DNA, but um, if it doesn't repair correctly, it can cause uh, cancer, which can grow to form a tumor and cause some serious problems. Um, this slide shows how ionizing radiation is very different if you eat, eat it or drink it or breathe it. it. When we go to the doctor and get an x-ray, the radiation passes through us, gets a nice picture of our bones for the doctor to see, but it doesn't lodge in our body. But these things like plutonium-239 and these other uh, radioactive isotopes, they lodge in your lungs, your bones, throughout your body, ovaries, liver, and um, then they can sit there and cause a problem. To take a closer look at three of these isotopes and where they lodge, uh, for example, iodine-131, it replaces normal iodine in our bodies, collects in our thyroid gland, and can cause cancer even at low doses there. Strontium-90, the body treats it like calcium and incorporates it into bones, where it can cause bone cancer and leukemia. Um, cesium-137, the body thinks it's potassium and incorporates it into many tissues, including muscle. 
and it can cause a variety of cancers. Um, radiation has no safe dose. Um, the EPA uh, has pointed out that doses are cumulative. They add up over our whole lives and increase risk with each new exposure. Um, the EPA standards explicitly state there's no safe dose. Even the NRC regulations reflect that there's no safe dose. And the National Academy of Science uh, also affirms this, that there's no safe dose. So this means that to prevent um, cancers, we need to prevent exposure. Well, let's take a closer look at how a nuclear plant works. On the left, you'll see a reactor vessel with control rods and fuel rods where the nuclear reaction is taking place. Uh, it boils water, which spins a turbine, which spins a generator and creates electricity. And then the lower right, you'll see the blue lines coming in from the side. That is coming in from the ultimate heat sink. That would be a river, lake, and ocean. And that's a critical part of the cooling of the nuclear reactor. Um, we'll see later how that can go awry and cause big problems. Um, atomic energy is a stupid way to boil water. That's what Buckminster Fuller mm -hmm. said. You're doing something very sophisticated, splitting atoms, to do something very simple, boiling water. So. Um, radioact radioactive waste is created at every step, beginning with the mining and refining of the fuel, enriching the fuel and fabricating it. But then when it gets to the nuclear plant, there's normal pr procedures is to vent some of this to the air, and that's completely allowed. Um, some of the things they don't even monitor for, it's a normal part of the process. But then um, the nuclear waste is really the, the big problem, uh, the spent fuel. It's the biggest source of radioactive waste. Here's an image of a spent fuel pool with fuel rod assemblies that they call them spent, but they're still, they're hot for five years and they're radioactive for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So this is where our big problems lie. No state wants it. Nevada said no to Yucca Mountain. Uh, no country in the world has a good long-term storage solution. Um, needs to be stored for thousands of years. Uh, the half-life of plutonium-239 is 24,000 years, so it's considered necessary to store these for 10 half-lives. That, that's a quarter of a million years, and as humans, we can't wrap our minds around storing something for 25,000 years. Most of us can't imagine storing something for more than 100 years. 70,000 tons of spent fuel have already built up in the U.S., 1.3 million pounds. And each reactor cranks out 25 more tons each year. Um, if the cooling fails in one of these spent fuel pools, it can catch fire within days and would spread radioactivity far and wide. So radioactive waste, it's a terrible legacy for us to leave to future generations. If we look at the cost of nuclear power, it's vastly expensive. Um, here's a picture of a third generation reactor being built in Finland. Um, it was promised for 06. It, it's been pushed back nine years. It was promised at a price of $4 billion. That has failed, it, looking at it at the cost of $10 billion, perhaps more. And it's not going to be profitable. And you can guess who's going to pick up the tab for it is the taxpayers. Um, small modular reactors have been proposed to address the cost question, but they still contain that fatal flaw of fission. They still create radioactive byproducts that cause cancer and other illnesses illnesses. Um, this is an image of a proposed small modular reactor that's actually developed down in Corvallis, Oregon by a company called New Scale. And these are supposed to be built on assembly lines, kind of factory style assembly line, and supposed to save money that way. But let's look at a couple of the claims of the company. They, they claim that this thing is self-contained. Well, it, it doesn't store its own waste. They're still going to have to pull out radioactive waste and store it for thousands of years in a different facility. So it's hardly self-contained over its lifetime. Another claim is that these will have a lower cost. Um, the IEER did a study that shows that uh, in order to set up an assembly line, um, they're going to have to have an order on about $90 billion. And there's no way that the uh, private investment is going to come up with that. It's going to require a federal subsidy. Once again, the cost will fall on, on the taxpayer. If we look at hidden costs of nuclear power, uh, the waste storage, we've already talked about, that cost falls on the taxpayer via the government. 
and the insurance, the liability is limited through something called the Price-Anderson Act. So again, the taxpayers will pick up the tab for, for accidents. If you look at research dollars, $147 billion is spent on nuclear versus $5 billion on solar and wind over the last 50 years. Imagine if those numbers have been reversed, how advanced solar and wind would be now. Um, there's over 30 subsidies in the whole fuel cycle. And what this means is that the subsidies cost more than the power is worth. And this is according to a study by the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, uh, this chart shows how over time nuclear is getting more expensive and solar is getting cheaper. And we're already past the point where the two lines cross um, to where nuclear is already more expensive in cents per kilowatt hour than and solar. And over the time, it's, the gap is only going to get wider. Solar is getting cheaper. Nuclear is getting more expensive. Then we have the issue that in March 2011, Japan experienced the worst industrial accident in the history of the world. That would have been the triple meltdowns at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Here's an image of the nuclear fallout map that shows a concentrated plume in three days touching the edge of Alaska across the North Pacific. And within 10 days, it got here to Oregon and across the west. And in fact, it was measured on the east coast as well and all throughout the northern hemisphere. Um, the, of course, a tsunami and earthquake knocked out the critical cooling and backup power to those plants. And they pretty quickly experienced three nuclear meltdowns. The cores melted down. Radiation releases began, and those releases continue to this day. Um, then there was three hydrogen explosions in three different containment buildings. And here's an image of a, an explosion of one of those containment buildings. And you see on the right a huge plume going straight up in the air, a massive explosion um, destroyed the containment buildings. The ra radiation releases contaminated much of Japan and spread across the Pacific Ocean. And here's an image of a woman with her baby. And the, technician with a Geiger counter trying to see if the baby's been contaminated. Um, I can only imagine what this poor woman is thinking as she's trying to get herself and her family out of that area, wondering if her, her small child has been contaminated with radiation. Um, if you look at the cost of homes and businesses and farms, you're looking at a cost of 250 to 500 billion dollars and, and still counting. We don't know the full cost of this disaster yet. But more importantly is the huge human toll. 159,000 people have been permanently displaced. Untold numbers of future cancer victims. This is the world's most dangerous technology gone horribly awry. Um, the disaster at Fukushima, now we're seeing an image of the reactor containment building number four. It's full of holes. It looks like Swiss cheese. It suffered that massive explosion and the Probably the most scary part is that near the top of that structure is a spent fuel pool. It's four or five stories off the ground, and it, if the cooling fails in there, it's going to really be a disaster. Now, be, they have built a structure around it to try to stabilize it, and they're starting now to remove 400 tons of highly irradiated spent fuel. Arnie Gunderson, of a nuclear engineer who used to build fuel assemblies and run nuclear power plants. He now runs uh, Fairwinds Energy Education. He has this warning regarding removing this fuel. He says, quote, there's a risk of an inadvertent criticality if the bundles are distorted and get too close to each other. The problem with a fuel pool criticality is that you cannot stop it. There are no control rods to control it. And by criticality, he means critical mass is reached and a nuclear reaction starts to take place. Not just nuclear decay of, of normal fuel, but uh, it would, would be a very bad day for Fukushima again. Now this image is the Columbia Generating Station at Hanford, Washington. It used to be known as Whoops 2. They figured out calling a nuclear plant Whoops wasn't a good idea. <laughs> so they hired a media company to help them find a new name. They conveniently left the word nuclear out of it, but the Columbia Generating Station is a GE Mark series reactor, very similar to the GE Mark series reactors that melted down at Fukushima. And here in this image, we see the big square or rectangular containment building, which is unlike the 
dome-shaped containment that we're more used to thinking of in a nuclear reactor. This is in Washington State on the Columbia River, about 200 miles from Portland. An accident here would just devastate this region. Um, back in 2009, the BPA uh, analyzed the cost of the CGS nuclear plant and found that it costs more to run than all 31 of the hydro plants in the Columbia Basin combined. So it's a very expensive plant to keep running. The CGS's spent fuel pool is elevated like the ones at Fukushima, and these are the most vulnerable components at operating reactors. Um, this is a statement from Robert Alvarez, who used to be a senior analyst to the Secretary of Energy and a Senate staff expert on nuclear issues. So if the cooling was lost and it caught fire, it could spread 10 times the radiation that was spread at Chernobyl. Um, Chernobyl, by the way, happened in the 1980s and contaminated much of Europe. It, the contamination from Chernobyl can still be measured in milk. Um, this is a graph of the bathtub curve, which shows failure of anything, whether it's a nuclear plant or car or any device. It's high at the beginning of the life of a product. Then during its normal useful life, it, it has a fairly low failure rate. But towards the end of its life, it starts to have a, an increasing failure rate. And the CGS, it's an old reactor. It's 29 years into a 40-year design life. So it's starting to get to that point to where it's going to start to have problems. If we look at some of the safety problems that they have had, they've had 22 sudden forced shutdowns called SCRAMs since the year 2000. And SCRAM is, <laughs> that's what you want to do if you're around one of these when it's having one of these. Um, the NRC recently cited CGS for having, quote, miscalibrated their monitors for 11 years, which means that they could have been having releases that went unmonitored. It's a very serious safety violation. If we look at known earthquake threat to that region, in 1872, there was a quake of magnitude 7.4, perhaps as high as 8, um, quite close to Hanford. And if we think about the, uh, new, some of the newly discovered information on those fault lines, we find out that the Hanford area does lie on several known earthquake faults in what's called the Yakima Fold and Thrust Belt. And the new research, new research shows that these faults are probably connected to the coastal faults, which is the Cascadia subduction zone, where we, that we know from geology that there is a large quake called the big one about every 300 to 500 years. We know from um, submerged trees that the last one happened in the year 1700. Many people mm -hmm. say we're due for it. And um, although a tsunami would not affect the Hanford area, earthquakes can definitely affect that area. Um, that was new research out of the University of Washington that showed that. Here we see an image of all the dams on the Columbia River um, and look at the ones upstream of Hanford. You see many dams that in an earthquake, if those dams failed, it could affect the cooling systems of, of the CGS reactor. Here's an image of a, a Earthen dam collapsing in 1976, where 300 square miles were flooded, two towns destroyed. So a failure of this type could wipe out CGS's cooling and, and cause a meltdown in Washington state. Then there's the threat of terrorist attacks. Um, the FBI came out and investigated CGS in 2002. There may have been a planned Al-Qaeda attack for some nuclear plant within the US at that time. And we, you think about that relatively weak containment structure, that rec rectangular containment building that's characteristic of the GE Mark series. No one knows what would happen if you flew a large airplane into one of those. And it's not something I want to think about. Um, the consequences of a meltdown or accident are, co are completely unacceptable. It would devastate the Columbia River as we know it. Um, it would contaminate our food and water supplies on a very large scale. It would displace large groups of people, some permanently. It would cause major economic impact, and hundreds of square miles of land could be made permanently uninhabitable. Here's an image of a 50-mile radius around Hanford, um, which this map is an uh, emergency planning map from the state of Washington. 300,000 people live in that 50-mile radius. 
And by the way, it's been pointed out to me that there's, there's nothing magic about that 50 mile radius. The, the plume will extend far beyond that. But even in that inner zone, there's a lot of people that live there. Message is, if it could happen in Japan, it could happen here. So we're calling that for the Columbia Generating Station to be closed before it closes us. Um, we don't want to be at the center of this nuclear plume. Uh, so it's time to take action. Uh, we're calling on people to call the governors of Oregon and Washington and ask them to close the CGS nuclear reactor on the Columbia River, number one. And number two, to not allow small modular reactors to be built in our states. We need an energy shift now, like these Japanese school children know. We need an energy shift. We know it too. Um, please, we're calling on people to call the governors and say no nukes, no old nukes, no new nukes. And we have Governor Kitzhaber's number here on the screen and Governor Inslee's number for our Washington listeners. Personally, I like going to their Facebook pages and commenting there because then they have a reason to respond um, and other people can see it. So I, f I find posting on Facebook to be a great way mm -hmm. to contact the governors. Okay, all right. So this was really a, 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 an informative and uh, alarming uh, that, uh, you know, in, in spite of all of these dangers, uh, the Columbia Generating Station was just had their license extended. Uh, for another 40 years, as I recall. That's correct, yes. Uh, it was, uh, t to me and many people, a great tragedy that they extended that license. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it, an aging it, reactor. It's, it's going to have problems, and God forbid it happened to this region. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, a and with the, you know, the lack of monitoring or the, or the fault monitoring, we don't really know what's happened up to this point, let alone being able to predict 40 years out what right. might be happening. Right, yeah. yes. Yeah. So if we closed uh, the Columbia Generating Station, mm -hmm. what replaces that energy? Mm. Well, you might recall hearing in the news where, like, <clears throat> there's times when they ask the wind, the wind uh, farms to stop producing so much energy because they're having a surplus. Um, of course, conservation efforts can go a long way. Um, sometimes it's touted that nuclear power is a 24-7 source of energy. Well, there was recently a six-month period where that plant was down for repairs, and they did um, over a thousand repairs. Um, so it's not 24-7. It's not ultimately reliable. And um, we think that wind and solar and other alternative energies can, mm -hmm. can fill that gap. Okay. And, and you said it was closed for six months? It was closed for six okay. months. And yet, as far as most of us citizens, we had no clue that it was closed. So That's it would true. suggest that we don't really absolutely have to have that energy right now. That's true. Right. We, we got by without it for six months. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a good point. Right. Yeah. And um, these Mark series reactors, there yes. are others in the United States? There are. There are several. Uh, the one in Fukushima was the. Uh, Mark I reactor. The one at Hanford, the CGS, is a Mark II reactor, but they're very similar designs. They were produced, um, one of the reasons that they have not the big, robust dome shape, but that rectangular um, containment structure was that the construction costs were a lot cheaper. Oh, yeah. So it's hard to say that they're a cheap reactor because they were vastly expensive, but they were cheaper than the competition and, and made that way on, on purpose. Uh -huh. Okay, so, you know, we, we won't spend very much money and we'll let other people worry about the danger later on. Good point, right. yes. Okay. Yeah, that was that part of the thinking, right. certainly. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for being here, David. Thank you, David Delk. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, and let, let me ask you also something else. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, available to do this presentation to other groups in the area? I am, yes, okay. I am. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, and how large an area would you, would you go to? Um, Oregon and Washington. Oregon and Washington. Yeah, this okay. can be given. So uh, that would be good information, and, uh, and we've included your contact information and, uh, so people can contact you directly Great. if they'd like to get this presented, because this is really a, an important topic, which is unfortunately not talked about very often. 
And you know what, Dave? We can train other people to give it too. Okay. But, but yes, we're, we would love to come to people's community and give this talk to any okay. group. Okay. David Hill, thank you very much. Thank you, David Delk. Okay, great. So our guest today has been David Hill, who is a volunteer with the Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility. He's been making the case against the continued use of, of or new uses of nuclear power. If you live in Oregon, please call Governor Kitzhoffer with the message that you want the Columbia Generating Station closed and you don't want the use of new nuclear reactors, including the small new, uh, modular reactors that are uh, being researched and developed here in Oregon as, uh, and elsewhere to be part of our energy mix as we move forward. Okay. Uh, so uh, Governor Kitzhoffer's phone number is uh, 503 excuse me, 378-4582. Uh, don't forget you can watch Populist Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash Populist Dialogues to view most of our past programs. And when you're there, click the subscribe button so that when a new program is uploaded, you'll automatically receive an email notification. Populist Dialogues is now seen in more places across the nation. In addition to our viewers here in Oregon and Washington, cable access pro stations in Modesto and Sacramento are now able to watch each week. And they're joining folks in Spokane, Boston, Sheboygan, Urbana, and elsewhere. And we just got notification that uh, the Temple University cable access um, station in Philadelphia will be broadcasting us at, with the beginning of the new year. So we want to welcome all those new viewers. Uh, we uh, would ask you to help us expand our viewership even further. You can just call your local cable access, access station and see how you can sponsor a weekly broadcast of our program. Such suggestions are usually quite welcome. Populist Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and about our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. Thanks to Roger Bates, Brad Leach, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas for their volunteer time getting us on the air. And thanks to all of you for watching. Thank you. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye. If you think corporations bought free speech before, Now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock. Cause I never heard my money talk. When a corporation has a colonoscopy, then I'll believe they're human like me.